When I did those 11 broadcasts, uh, not last Sunday, it was the Sunday before, uh, I was introduced as an atheist and uh, the presenters were a bit astonished that I was standing in the same place as many of the speakers on this subject. And I was often asked by the presenters across the regions, why are you opposing a change in the law? Well, it's simple, said I. I don't believe that one person should be given the legal right to kill another person. It's as simple as that. That's a one-line argument against our opponent's dignity in dying. Please remember it. Well, we've had one speaker from the House of Lords who is a distinguished speaker, not only in this field, but in other fields as well. And we now have another. Uh, Lord Macaul has often spoken against a change in the law on this subject. And we're absolutely delighted, Ian, that you could be with us this afternoon. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say on the subject. Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me here. Sometimes you have to see the funny side of a subject. And um, when we got involved in the Voluntary Euthanasia Society campaign, um, one of the amazing things that they claimed was that 96% of the people of this country wanted a pain-free death. So I thought, wait a minute. What about the other 4%? Did he want a painful death? What a load of rubbish. And a lot of these statistics are of that character. I'd like to tell you about um, some of my patients. Um, Alison, lovely lady of about 40, came to give evidence to the, to the Select Committee on Euthanasia some years ago. And she came in, she was in a wheelchair, and she started. I've come up all the way from Cornwall, and it went on like this. She was so breathless, so disabled. And she said, I um, was born with a number of uh, congenital anomalies, and uh, I coped pretty well with all of them, and then I got an incurable disease. And I said, that's it. I've coped very well for 30 years. I've had enough. I want euthanasia. And so they refused uh, to give her this, as it was against the law. And she made three serious attempts on her life. And her friends rescued her every time. And she took on a new lease of life. They persuaded her that life was worth living. And she decided to get involved in charity work, and she set up a charity looking after orphans in India. And she said, I've come all this way from Cornwall to tell you that that was 10 years ago, and they're the best 10 years of my life. And if you devils had legalized euthanasia, I wouldn't be here. I would have been deprived of the best 10 years of my life. What you got to say to that? Well, that had them speechless. We went to Oregon to see uh, how things were working there, and the whole of that business is very divisive. That was the, the main thing we found out there. We also found out that a lot of people being given euthanasia were in fact depressed, and uh, they had not been properly assessed about their depression, let alone treated. The treatment of depression is not execution, it is treatment. Then we went to Holland, and we met one of the doctors who um, was uh, carrying out euthanasia, and I asked him, what was it like doing your first case of euthanasia? Oh, he said it was terrible. You know, we agonized all day. It really was very, very unpleasant. But we eventually did it. He said, the next case was really much easier. And then I quote, he said, the third case was a piece of cake. And that had everyone chilled at that meeting, including all those who were advocating euthanasia. 
Then there was a man who came into hospice and he had widespread cancer uh, involving his bones. And of course, as you know, when that happens, it tends to mobilize the calcium from the bones and the, the level of calcium then starts to rise in the blood. And if it rises high enough, the heart stops. And so he was given um, treatment to keep the calcium down. And uh, he comes into the hospice and asks for euthanasia. And they say, no, we don't do that sort of thing. And he asks for it again and again. And then the doctor said, just a minute. You know those tablets you're taking to keep your calcium down? Well, all you have to do is stop them. And you'll be dead tomorrow. He never stopped taking the tablets until he died. And that's another facet that we have to, to grasp. Now, what do we do with people who are in pain and distress? Well, I looked after a lovely lady. She was 28. And she came in and she was dying of a cancer of her throat. And... Um, she not only was in pain, but was in quite a bit of respiratory distress. And she wanted relief. And I said, I will relieve all your symptoms. That's my job as a doctor. I have no problem with that. And I explained what I was going to do, put a needle into her vein and titrate her. Just give her the right amount of heroin to relieve all her symptoms. And I said to her, just tell me when all the symptoms go, the pain and the distress in breathing and so on. And so very slowly, because um, you have to, you, what you do is you put the heroin, because it's a small volume, put it in a large volume of saline in a large syringe and gently start to give it intravenously. And she began to relax and then suddenly she said, ah, all the symptoms have gone. I said, great, there we are. Did it kill her? No. She took on a new lease of life. You see, unrelieved symptoms, unrelieved pain, that often is the killer. She did die, of course, a few weeks later. But our job is to relieve all the symptoms, and we can do that. Sometimes we have to give an amount that um, makes them pretty sleepy. But our job is to relieve all symptoms. And that we can do. Now there's another aspect of this. We are accused as doctors of struggling officiously to keep alive. That actually comes from a rather cynical poem, but that's another matter. Um, do, do doctors really struggle too much to keep people alive who really are dying? I shall always remember um, a surgeon I worked for at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, uh, Sir James Patterson Ross. And he couldn't stand noise in the theatre. And if any noise, he would put the, put the knife down and start saying, what's going on here? <laughs> well, a nurse came into the theatre while he was operating and um, started rushing around like a scalded cat. And he's, so he puts the knife down. What are you doing? Oh, there's been a cardiac arrest in the ward, sir. This is 1960 before closed cardiac massage came in and they were opening chests right, left and centre and the corridors and the ambulances. That was a terrible time. And um, Sir James said, no, 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 nurse. I'll tell you what's happened. One of my patients has died and the doctors don't recognise death when they see it. Now you see, uh, he had a point. Um, we don't struggle uh, officiously to keep alive. But we do have a problem sometimes because medicine and prophecy are two separate subjects. You don't always know. And I remember um, a man came in with a ruptured aneurysm of his abdominal aorta. The thing had given way. The mortality is usually 50%. This patient, he ruptured his aneurysm into his gut, uh, which was a very serious and usually lethal problem. Well, we operated on him, and uh, surprisingly, he survived, largely because he was indestructible, I expect. But um, he then got every complication in the book. Everything went wrong. 
And the last straw, I mean, I won't go bore you with all the complications, but he, he was having a terrible time. And um, he kept, his heart stopped beating, and the nurses were marvellous. They leapt on him, thumped his chest, and got him going again. And then, of course, you put a great electric shock across them, and it can be quite unpleasant. And after a while, he said, I've had enough of that, I want to die. And so the nurses said, we better let him go. I said, wait a minute, he hasn't got a lethal condition, and he's lost his wife, and he has a boy of 12. Who's going to look after the boy? But the man said, I want to die. Well, you know what happens, they put a lot of pressure on you, the nurses come to you, this is terrible, you must let him die, and so on. But I refused for a whole week, which was extremely unpleasant. And then finally, I agreed. If he has a cardiac arrest again, let him go. He never did, and he survived. So you don't always know. And then there was a man in the London hospital, he was only 35, he had a coronary thrombosis, and he kept arresting. And the nurses again were pretty good at getting him going again, and putting, shocking him and so on. And in the end he said, I've had enough of this, I want to die, next time let me go. So it was all documented, everyone met and it was all drawn up that if he arrested once more, they had to let him go. Well, you know what happened. A doctor from another ward just happened to be walking through that ward and happened to pass by the bed when he had another cardiac arrest. Well, he didn't know the history and so he resuscitated him. And it's a terrible row. But actually, he survived another 10, 20 years, so he was quite grateful. So it can be extremely difficult to know medicine and prophecy are two quite separate subjects. Well, I should declare an interest because um, I've been involved in the hospice movement for quite a while now. Um, we um, were associated with um, the Mild May Hospital, um, and it was closed by a young a minister called Kenneth Clark in 1984, being surplus to requirement. And we went to see him uh, because we wanted the hospital back. And the civil servant said to Kenneth, on no account are you to give them their hospital back. So what does Kenneth do? Yes, of course you can have the hospital back, no problem at all. But you won't get any money to run it. Well, we did get money to run it, it was opened, and then the government asked us to look after people who are dying of AIDS because no one would touch them. This is 1984. The hospitals wouldn't have them, the hospices wouldn't take them, and even the undertakers wouldn't take the bodies away, so it was a, a bad time. And so we learned how to do it, and then we were asked to set up a similar organization in Uganda. So I've been involved in the hospice movement for quite a while, and I'm now the president of uh, St. Christopher's Hospice, founded by a colleague of mine, Cicely Saunders. We were contemporaries. A bit of just to point out, she was 15 years older than me, but uh, she'd done nursing and she was an almoner before she took up medicine. But what an amazing movement it's been, starting with Cicely Saunders at St. Christopher's Hospice and it's spread throughout the world. And that is the answer. We have to respect people and do the very best for them. It's a sign of a civilized society that we, took, that we look after our old people, and our dying people. We must resist this bill that's coming in, and we must fight it tooth and nail. Thank you.